I've been advised not to call uh, Ruben Ebron a monster. Yeah, someone will report a, um, a car stolen. It's a 95 Honda Civic. A web of lies. He's very, very playful, always smiling. <laughs> Manipulation. Why did you lie about not knowing Ebron? And a little boy that connected this community. It's been one year since the death of 21-month-old Lonzi Barton. Hope kept police searching. We're not ready to shut that book. In the heat, in the swamps, underwater, in the worst of conditions, it was a hope that would soon fade. Had this baby been found earlier, would there have been a different result? Possibly, but we'll never know. The reality more heartbreaking than the mystery. Tonight, one year later, we look back as we look forward. It's a story that gripped our community for months. This Sunday marks one year since the disappearance of Lonzi Barton, the toddler reported missing early one July morning. Good evening, I'm Heather Crawford. And I'm Jeannie Blaylock. What followed were strangers joining forces with police in search for the little boy. All of this while the clouds of suspicion darkened over the child's mother, Lana Barton, and her boyfriend, Reuben Ebron, about what they really knew. Investigators spent months chasing down leads. It would take six months before the remains of little Lonzi were discovered in a wooded area. Over the next 30 minutes, you'll hear from those closest to the case, including new details that we've never heard before. And we begin tonight with my interview with State Attorney Angela Corey. She's opening up about what happened behind the scenes and what could happen with this case in the future. This tree has fallen since we were out here. Walking to the woods where Reuben Ebron led authorities on a cold January night. Kept going back towards the same area. State Attorney Angela Corey vividly remembers what it was like being there. It was six months after Ebron reported this beautiful blue-eyed boy missing. I've been prosecuting for 34 and a half years. I will never understand people who harm babies, never. Corey says Ebron led them very close to Lonzi Barton's remains that night. He led the detective straight into these woods. He, he came exactly to this spot. But it wasn't until the next morning when authorities came back to the woods that he was found. The plea bargain we made with Ebron was dependent not just on him taking us out here, but on us recovering Lonzi's body and that any determination by a medical examiner matched what he said happened to this baby. Thinking about someone being able to toss out a child as a piece of trash, I mean, how, how hard on a personal level was that for you to know that that little boy had been out here for six months? It's always so hard. It was a spot Lonzi's five-year-old sister, who Ruben was watching the night he reported Lonzi missing, had alluded to early on in the investigation. Was she able to tell you what happened? She told us, yes, she was able to tell us that they came to the scary woods. She told us that. She gave a few other descriptions. She talked about being out here, but at the time we didn't know this is where it was. Imagine that baby sat right behind us, Heather, in a car while the man her mother left her entrusted with took her baby brother into those woods and left him like a pile of trash. She's a precious little girl. She's very vocal. She was very forthcoming with us, but still, she was five years old. What could she tell us? Hundreds of officers and community members had spent countless hours searching ponds and woods looking for little Lonzi. Things that haunted me the next day when we came back out to do the press conference is I looked over and knew these, this was where we were walking, right next to the highway, and these are the woods where he was found. So he was literally a stone's throw away from thousands or possibly more people who had come right by here. I remember being out here uh, that next day yes. and I remember when word started to spread that there had been a, a plea deal and that Reuben was um, going to serve 20 years in prison. I, I, I vividly remember one woman just crying and saying, how can you tell me that child was only worth 20 years? I wish I could talk to each and every person that felt that way. We were limited by what we could prove. The maximum we were going to get at the trial which if you remember, the trial was set to start the following Monday, the next morning. And um, he decided he wanted to plead. That Sunday afternoon, I was on my way back from my 
Nisa's dance convention in Orlando and got the call. We need you down here immediately. So I went straight to the police memorial building. Everyone gathered. The sheriff had everyone he thought he needed there. And we talked for hours about whether it was the right thing to do. So my choice was simple, Heather, give up 10 years off of a 30 year maximum sentence to get that baby's body back. And that's what we had to do. Why did you not go for first degree murder? Why did you not go for, for a longer sentence? It's because we couldn't prove it. We can only prove what the facts and the law allow us to prove. So much time had passed and once the baby's body, you know, had degenerated to the point where it was just bones, it's very difficult to determine the cause of death or to disprove what Reuben Ebron said happened, which he said was an accident. Ebron claimed Lonzi had drowned in a bathtub while he and Lonzi's mother, Lana Barton, were in another room. One of the things that was compelling to Rich in London was the, the wetness of the carpet. Um, and when he said where he laid the baby after he found him in the tub, it did match the physical evidence found in the master bedroom. They look at this evidence and they go, it, it could have happened that way. And again, nothing else to disprove it, but that one fact backing him up. Were you surprised um, as we walked back here that it took six months for him to lead authorities to Lonzi's body? Well, if you remember, he had been going back and forth with the detectives. He would call Sergeant Corsi and a couple of different detectives. He would call them over to a cell and claim he wanted to tell us where Lonzi was, and then he wouldn't give the location. We continued to work on Lana Barton. Mm -hmm. We sent her in to talk with him. We did everything legally that we could do to try to force them to tell us where this baby was. And, and was she the key? Lana? Mm -hmm. You know, it could be that once she pled and he knew she was gonna testify, that he just wanted to, you know, come clean, as they say. Mm -hmm. But whatever the impetus was, we had to act that night. Otherwise, we were gonna go forward to trial. I'm certain we would have con convicted him we would have gotten 30 years and never known where Lonzi was, never. We're, we're pretty certain Lana didn't know, but that's even another thing we'll never know for sure, whether she actually knew her own flesh and blood baby was out here and never told us. Lana pleaded guilty to child neglect and lying to police. She was sentenced to five years. Was it hard to see her only get five years? Absolutely it was hard. It was hard to see him only get 20 years, but again, we can't go on what we know, we have to go on what we can prove in a court of law. I need the public to remember that everything they hear through the media or that they can even read in a police report might never come in as evidence. We operate with a filter called the rules of evidence. So when they say, but what about this? And you knew that and you knew that, we may know it. We may never be able to get that fact in front of a jury because we have rules that guide what evidence comes in to prove someone's guilt. Ebron is scheduled to get out of prison in his early 50s. I'm very proud of the plea deal because it still gives us an out. If we can ever determine that Ebron lied about how Lonzi died, we can still go after him and prosecute him for the higher crime. In the future, you that still can. That was specifically written into the plea. That was the last thing we wrote in or I wouldn't have approved the plea bargain. So is the case closed? I don't know that this case will ever be closed. I think there's closure, having recovered that precious baby's body and allowing the people who grieve for him to know he's now buried. And uh, for those of us who believe he's in heaven with our God, I think it allowed closure, but the criminal case will never be closed. And the blue-eyed boy at the center of this case became a fixture on our Facebook timelines as so many cried out for his safe return. But of course, that wasn't meant to be. Here's a look back at how the events around Lonzi's disappearance unfolded. My kid is in the back of the car. July 24th, 2.20 a.m., Ruben Ebron calls 911 saying someone stole his car with a little boy inside. The car is found about 15 minutes later with no signs of the toddler. Four hours after he's reported missing, a statewide Amber Alert is issued for Lonzi. But what you didn't hear 
was an Amber Alert emergency siren. Officials said they didn't push one out because they didn't have a vehicle description to put out in the alert. With the story not adding up, by midnight, Ebron is charged with child neglect. Drove into work this morning and I watched the sunrise, the beautiful sunrise, and I thought, there's a 21-month-old that will probably not ever see a sunrise again. It leads to a massive police search involving hundreds of officers and volunteers scouring an area roughly 40 square miles, searching every pond and lake along the way in the scorching summer heat. And how many searches have you done? Um, total of four now. Four now. You got some more planned? Yes, sir. During that time, the remains of two people unrelated to this case are discovered. On August 2nd, the 10-day search is scaled back. The next day, surveillance video is released showing Ebron's car driving within blocks of where investigators found it and a man said to be Ebron sprinting back toward his apartment. The case has changed from a possible abduction to homicide. The Amber Alert canceled. On August 15th, Lana and Chris Barton sit down with Heather Crawford for an exclusive interview, their first together since the disappearance. To see other mothers, I guess you would say, with babies and, you know, stuff there that are his size and the saying you, you, you want what you can't have is definitely true. Three days later, Lana Barton is arrested and charged with child neglect and lying to police. On January 6th, she pleads guilty and agrees to testify against Ebron, but claims she still doesn't know what happened. But on the night of January 10th, the day before jury selection is set to begin for his trial, Ebron leads police to a woods where Lonzi's remains are found the next morning, concealed under a pile of tires. Ebron reaches a deal pleading guilty to aggravated manslaughter. On February 5th, he's sentenced to 20 years in prison without the possibility of parole. He also reveals his version of what happened. He says the toddler drowned in a bathtub while he and Lana were in another room. On March 4th, Lana Barton is sentenced to five years behind bars. So what was it like for those first responders out searching for this little boy? Up next, we hear from the team who handled this case in their own words. I pounded it into your head from birth. Do not get into the system. Plus, we talk with Ruben Ebron's father and also former girlfriend about life now after Lonzi. A phone call in the middle of the night asking if you're ready for a very long day. That's how several JSO members described the call they got the night that Lonzi went missing. Katie Jeffries talked with a group of JSO's finest to discuss key moments in the investigation. 
as the days started to turn into day after day, how frustrated, how I'm sure it had to be tough to control almost your anger at that point that he just was not being helpful to you guys and you still had people out there searching. Was that tough to, to manage the frustration? It's absolutely very frustrating when you know that there's a person that you can talk to uh, that knows exactly what happened. And going out in the car with him, I mean, he knew exactly where he was going and it really matched up to what our, our cell phone records told us. So the closer I got, I was feeling more comfortable that he was not leading us on a goose chase. That was in my mind the whole time. Is, is he, one, going to show us where this child is? Is he, two, going to try to escape in some manner? Or is he, three, just sending us down another one of his, his rabbit holes? But he continued to talk about these set of tires and the way the tires were set up. I think I heard you say spotlight. He wanted the spotlight back on him. He, all, he always liked the spotlight. When he lost control, like Chief Denji said, he would, he would become more... Uh, he'd lose control of himself. He'd want to get more agitated, but whenever he felt like he was in control, his demeanor would change. In court, he came out and said that Lonzi died in the bathtub. You all know this case better than anybody else. Do you actually think he was telling the truth, or do you think that was another lie? His history of telling lies is so pervasive that I don't believe anything that comes out of his mouth. Uh, if we can't prove it independently, then I don't believe it. I am. There are friends of Reuben and Lana's who saw them use drugs and sell drugs in proximity of him and his sister that didn't pick up a phone and didn't call us. Had they done that, maybe we wouldn't be sitting here today. The focus that, that is placed on this anniversary of this little boy's death, it, it, can, be, it can be well used by good intentioned folks. To try and prevent the next yeah, situation. Yeah, like exactly. Like and, and we're all poised and ready for when that call comes at two something in the morning again and uh, for the next really long day and we're, we just hope it doesn't come. Now the Remembering Lonzi Facebook page is encouraging everybody to light a candle each night leading up to the anniversary of his disappearance which is on Sunday. And you can post pictures of your candles on the First Coast News Facebook page in Lonzi's memory. I said did you do something that caused harm to him and you panicked? He said, no, Daddy, I didn't do that. Would he tell you? I would hope. That was Reuben Ebron's father last July, still with hope that his son had nothing to do with the disappearance. But as you know, that turned out not to be the case. So we wanted to hear again from Reuben Ebron Sr. now that a year has passed. I ask him how he hangs on and he says God has never let him down. And what about visiting his son in prison in South Florida? He says he will, but just not yet. For now, they write letters and they talk. But he says some mornings still are hard. He wakes up with a very heavy heart. As a Navy veteran, I mean, you carry that respect, right? Yes. You always handled things with dignity throughout this entire drama. But was there ever a point when you just got angry and wanted to scream about everything? There's a point where I did. I. It was after about the third or fourth hearing that I went to, and I was so mad leaving that courtroom. At whom? At the system, and at Reuben for putting himself in the system. Mr. Ebron says it's not fair his son got a felony conviction and nobody else involved did. He thinks both his son and Lana Barton both should have felonies. And for the first time now on First Coast News, we're also hearing from Ruben's former girlfriend, the mother of their three biological children, now ages 8, 7, and 17 months old. Jessica Ripple and the children live with Ruben's father and mother in Jacksonville, and she says the kids are doing well. They are doing amazing. Uh, they both got A's and S pluses in school, so I'm very proud that this hasn't affected them. Jessica tells me Reuben writes to his children from prison. And it's not just Ebron's family impacted. We reached out to Lana Barton's family, but our requests were denied. We're told Lana's five-year-old daughter, who was with Ebron the night Lonzi disappeared, as you just heard, is living with her grandmother and is doing well. We had some hope that maybe, maybe. the little fella could be found alive. Up next, Baker County Sheriff Joey Dobson on the emotional toll of the Lonzi Barton case and the decision he made that he's been criticized for most often.
It seems that everyone we talk to in law enforcement tells us this case had such a major impact on it. And them. that's true for Baker County Sheriff Joey Dobbs. And he talked with me about that and the criticism over allowing Chris and Lana Barton to attend Lonzie's funeral. Small town. I feel sad. But big bad memories. I don't think they will ever forget it. What if it had been my family? What if it had been my child or my grandchild? For the folks in McClenny, and for most of us, you remember it all started with this photo. I think it was from the very first picture with a little boy walking down the hall with the boots on. It still hurt, and it's still, it's still gonna hurt no matter what. And I don't think time even changes that. I'm sitting here with Sheriff Joy Dobson because it takes us back. I mean, it realistically, you kind of knew, but there was still hope that night. There, there, there was. So many folks in McClenny showing their support. We had some hope that maybe, maybe. the little fella could be found alive. But the crime for Dobson, it was like some of his own hometown folk going so, so wrong. He's known Chris Barton, the father in Lonzie's life for years. Barton now in jail on drug charges. I, I, I believe Chris got caught up in the, the moment of, of her and I think, I think he loved Lana. They were close at one time uh, and I think he really did care about her and I think he probably thought that if he could stay close enough to her maybe that, that he knew what she was doing that maybe he might be able to, they might be able to resolve their problems once she got out of this kind of situation that she was in in Jacksonville. But I do think uh, Chris is not a bad person at all. All that, despite Lana showing up with Ruben Ebron's name tattooed in huge letters on her middle. People have had a million theories about all this, but I did hear someone say that no little girl dreams of growing up and becoming a stripper. And no doubt, the drama for months drew out one side against another. Oh, some said she was at least working, trying to support herself. And other people saying, you know, what kind of mother would be at Wacko's and leave their little boy? So there was so much going on on yeah. social media with yeah. that. As for Ruben Ebron, a plea deal for 20 years for aggravated manslaughter. When you heard 20, what yeah. was your reaction? Well, I, I probably uh, is that all, but there again, I was not privy to what they, they, so to speak, worked out with him in a plea agreement. And one more thing, obviously still on the sheriff's mind. I say obviously because he brought it up himself. I got criticized about the funeral. It was your decision to take Lon and Chris to Lon's funeral. Absolutely. You really thought it was I, the right decision. I, I did not harden myself with that at all, and, and I think, uh, I hope, that it was because I cared about people. I cared about the fact that that was their child, they had to be hurt by it. That was their final closure with this little boy. And I have no regrets today, and, and I'll take the criticism for it. And no matter what, Lonzie's case, out of all he's ever seen as sheriff for 20 plus years. There's probably never been one more sad. Sad for us all. Mm -hmm. Dobson says he has told both Lana and Chris to serve their time and then come out and be the good people the community expects them to be. And hopefully they will do just that. We'll be right back.